So I'd like to welcome you to Travels Through Time, Murray. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure, Violet. First, I'd like to just ask you a bit about yourself. You're Professor of Literature at Glasgow University. And I wondered if you could just tell us a bit about your academic career and um, your interests. Okay, so uh, I'm a graduate of Glasgow and Oxford, where I did a doctorate on history of ideas, uh, actually history of decadence as an idea, which is rather removed from what I do now. <laughs> uh, from what I do now. And uh, I've since worked at uh, six universities, um, many of them in, in uh, uh, senior uh, administrative positions in more recent years. So I don't do a conventional, uh, a conventional um, teaching department focused job. I write extensively in both history and literature, and uh, that's been going. That's been the uh, the entirety of my uh, my career, and I'm very interested in the global context because of the way in which relationships define nations and places and cultures, just as though much as they do people, and uh, we often think of nationality particularly in certain countries these days, in a very, very introspective way, as if it exists independent of its relationships with others, but it doesn't. And so that's a key interest I've covered in more than one book, for example, Robert Burns in Global Culture, or indeed in the, uh, in the association that I founded, the International Association for the Study of Scottish Literatures, and reception of Robert Burns or Walter Scott in Europe, and indeed the global aspects of the Jacobite movement, which is my core area of research. So that's a, a, a summary of parts uh, of um, my career to date. And that's how I got to be writing a book like Scotland, the Global History, because I was asked to do history of, another history of Scotland by Yale. And I said, I'm not going to do that. You've got enough of them. What you want is this, Scotland, the Global History. So that's what we have. And it, it is very interesting, isn't it, how literature plays this really important role in cross-cultural exchange and understanding. I, I saw that you were also Knowledge Exchange Champion for 2022. And so I wondered if you could tell us a bit about that and, and what that involves. That's an, a national competition in Scotland. It's an annual uh, prize, the number of knowledge exchange prizes. The overall Champions Prize goes to somebody with a wide diversity of impacts in different industries. So that was for four things. It was for chairing the Kelvin Hall development, which is, uh, well, 35 million, but that was several years ago, development, uh, which brings together the National Library of Scotland, uh, Moving Image Archive, joint facilities for the National Library and the University, and the city's sports, uh, sport and gym facilities, as well as their, some of their museum and community collections in the Kelvin Hall as a kind of completely new imagined space uh, for multiple uh, collaborative use, which is for everybody from four-year-olds doing table tennis to um, tea dances for not four-year-olds. Uh, but, uh, but for 30 to 40% of people actually uh, engage with the moving image archive where you can flick through films at your seat, or uh, alternatively, look at the collections of the university. Uh, the university is the fourth largest and third most significant uh, museum and gallery collection uh, in the UK uh, or the city. So uh, really everything from museum to gym uh, to tea shop um, in one place. So that was one. The second was the study for um, the Scottish government on Robert Burns and the Scottish economy, which developed a new methodology for measuring the impact of literary figures on economic development in, in uh, local authorities and indeed more broadly. The third was the uh, Scottish Heritage Partnership, which was a study of what people, visitors to visitor attractions most want from new and immersive technology and the creation of a business case, uh, what a good business case would look like for the introduction of uh, VR or immersive technology in those areas. And the last was the placemaking study for Barclays Bank. So in the International Financial Services District of Glasgow, Barclays Bank have got a, 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 what they call a Glasgow campus with 5,000 jobs, which is 5,000 more than Twitter's going to be having by tonight, by the looks of things. Um, but <laughs> and they, they wanted to ensure that they had, they had a very strong historic location. It's, of course, a new building, a new, totally new development 
but they would have an historic Glasgow location and to name the streets appropriately. Of course, they wanted particularly to steer off streets which could be associated with people who had any role or benefit from the transatlantic slave trade. So they wanted to, I mean, obviously they didn't want to, to, to create any kind of animus or concern among their staff or among the citizens in opening this new facility. So it was about finding the right way and the right periods of Glasgow's history and the place that, where they were in the Bloomer Law and the banks of the Clyde to actually ensure that it was both historic and it was also completely safe. It sounds so impressive that you are an academic and your main areas of, that you write about are Burns and the Jacobites. And, and yet you, you have this incredible sort of active, modern life. I think that's so impressive. And, and, and I wonder, is that quite unusual? Are you quite unusual or, or is that something which is happening more, do you think? I think, it's quite, I think it is quite unusual. But what I would say is for the younger generation of academics, and I'm not including myself, um, the, the, uh, it is happening more because they're very much geared to a socially inclusive uh, education for students and also a socially inclusive engagement with the third sector and with uh, business and enterprise. So that's a lot more developed than it was among academics 25 years ago. And so that, uh, so I find, you know, there, there, a lot of, a lot of, um, early career scholars to talk to because they get it. And some of them indeed now come themselves out of business and may go back to business at various times. It's a different, it's a different sort of pattern because particularly in things like digital, there are some very, very smart people in business. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want to um, make most computer science departments competitive with Google because most of them wouldn't be. And, uh, The people involved there are very smart and there's no reason why people, not even Google, but but lower level um, tech firms, but still very highly developed ones, shouldn't have a mixed career. And and some of them are starting to do that. Mm. And I'm sure the cross-pollination between the two worlds is really um, fruitful. So I just want to ask you briefly, before we move on to the, um, the business of the interview, I want to ask you briefly about Glasgow, because... I lived in Edinburgh for many years and I used to visit Glasgow and I had some of the best times of my life. I think it is an absolutely incredible city, but I think perhaps it's a city which people, it wouldn't be top of their list for somewhere to go and visit. So can you just talk a little bit about Glasgow and and why it's such an exciting place to live? Well, I guess that one other thing, the thing about Glasgow is that it's modern and edgy. And there's a really nice balance with Edinburgh, which is so historic and traditional. And Glasgow today is is transformed from the the immediate struggles of the post-industrial era in the 1970s and 80s. In fact, in 2019, it became the the European Commission uh, decided that it was the cultural capital of the UK and one of the most cultural cities in Europe. I remember being on LBC to discuss that. I think <laughs> they were obviously thought they obviously thought it shouldn't be Glasgow, but they were quite good natured about it. So there are an awful lot of high quality, traditional, and more modern uh, visitor attractions. And there are obviously a, bit, a big club and restaurant life. It's a kind of place where you find. I'm not sure if they're all open now, but you find Korean restaurants, Mongolian restaurants, Russian restaurants, regional Spanish restaurants. Um, it's that sort of experiment experimental pushing out and engaging with a, a, a bigger slice of modernity and in recent years the economic growth rate of the city has been very strong it's been between two and four percent which in uk terms is is yeah. very high so commercial rents are actually among the highest in the uk in other words you know in the 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 center of the center and west end of glasgow is very is very bustling and noticeably, um, in many ca- in many cases, better off than some other UK cities. Mm. So let's go to the book now. Um, my um, one of my questions I wanted to ask you was: um, you picked uh, 1603 as the starting point, which is obviously a very definite moment in Scottish history because it's the, when the union of the crowns happened and James the Sixth um, became James the First. Talk us through why that was the starting point for you, why you decided to begin it there. I suppose I began it there because really I wanted to begin with the Thirty Years' War. 
because it's it's a, it's such a critical um, um, period of engagement with Scotland in continental history. But it didn't make sense to start with the, that war in 1618 without acknowledging what had happened in 1603, which made a big difference to the way in which Scotland interacted with that war. And that was, of course, the accession of James VI to the English throne. So it was a union of a sort, but a union very much of the comp- what we call the composite monarchy model, um, that is multiple kingdoms ruled by a single ruler. In fact, the crown of Great Britain is still a, is still a multi-kingdom, has a composite monarchy model, because Charles is king of I've got quite a large number of overseas territories as well as of uh, as of Scotland. Yeah. So it's that model that's that that occurs in 1603. That model is now really quite poorly understood because largely composite monarchies and many of them, like the Holy Roman Empire, were very successful, have faded from view. And the UK and Spain are arguably the only two left in Europe. But Spain actually doesn't really believe it is a composite monarchy a, a, anymore, which is one of the reasons for the difficulties over Catalonia. So um, that so in a way, it's it's an older form of constitutional arrangement, which depends really much more on the crown, and the countries under the crown are often basically autonomous. Nonetheless, it's one that was very popular at the time and worked. There's nothing odd about Scotland and England's union of 1603, which is simply a regnal union, not a political union. Yeah. And what were your aims in writing it? I mean, as you said at the beginning, there's been lots of histories of Scotland. Um, So your approach was different because you're looking at it from a global point of view and you talk a lot about the Scottish diaspora and um, Scotland in the world. What what did you want to, what what do you want readers to take away from it? I want readers to take take away um, both the... uh, the excessive nature of Scotland, its immense globality, both for good and ill, because too many uh, discussions of global Scots have been all about the nice ones or the ones you want to say are nice, and there are quite a lot of nasty ones in there. No two ways about that. Mm. And to get people to think also about, the, both at the beginning and the end of the period, about the nature of uh, sovereignty, because the history presents Scotland as always a place which is Scotland and... Scotland has always seeped out beyond its borders and has needed a set of external relationships. And the the issue really today is how far Scotland's external relation has access to external relationships. Um, And of course, leaving the EU is the most critical aspect of that. And one of the reasons for the immensely different outcome of the 2016 vote in Scotland and England that Scotland has always looked beyond its borders for its key relationships. And the reason that it's been in a union for many, for three, more than three centuries with England is because that union was, in the words of another uh, Scottish historian, a union for empire. Um, it was effectively an instrumental union which gave Scots access to imperial markets and the ability to exploit them with their intensely realised networks. And the book also explains, people always talk about networks, it explains how the networks functioned and gives you some examples of really incredibly successful networks containing basically a relatively few people, but all in influential positions in different walks of life that made critical differences, for example, as Thomas Blake Glover did in Japan. And of course, Scotland, before this period, but before you, the period where you start, was very closely connected to France through the old alliance and do you think that the Scottish attitude towards Europe today is still affected by those historic relationships? In sentimental terms, I think it is. I think people are aware of the relationships with France. They're not as aware of the almost equally important relationships with the Netherlands to nearly the same extent. But they do have a sentimental view of Scotland as European. So when The Economist uh, did a poll in 1999 about which flag you identified with, 25% of people in England identified with the Stars and Stripes as their flag. Um, <laughs> what? Yes. <laughs> Not necessarily as their only flag, but they, this was an identity flag for them. They were re- happy to, to, to recognise they were included under the Stars and Stripes. And in Scotland, that was negligible. But um, the, the European stars were significantly more uh, prevalent in Scotland and England where they were negligible. 
So um, it's interesting the way in which people articulate their secondary identities. And obviously the secondary identity of England is primarily American. Hmm. That's, that's quite a thought, quite a statistic. And you talk about Scotland's brand, and that is certainly uh, very strong. I think, you know, most places you go in the world, if you mention the, na- the word Scotland, people will have in their head an idea. And you, you, you have this great phrase, bagpipes, mountains, tartan and whiskey. And I wonder um, how important do you think that that is for Scotland today and, and, and how it's quite an old fashioned identity. Do you think Scotland is in the process of forging a new global identity? I think it is up to a point. I think it was a very interesting transition. And I, I've given evidence of that to the, 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 the Scottish Parliament and elsewhere. The traditional brand is too strong to be abandoned. But, for example, if you look at international perceptions of Scotland, Scotland finishes outside the top 20 in terms of national brand recognition for science. But Scotland is the third most highly cited territory in the world for science research per capita. So there is a there is a disjunction. And w- one of the things I was involved in at the beginning of this year was the Dubai Expo, which was postponed because of COVID and so on. And one of the things that was really piquant at this Dubai Expo was the presentation on Scotland and the space industry and space research, because uh, uh, this went live and it went all the way up to a, to a significant report on CNN that evening, because the idea that Scotland had a significant space industry, satellite manufacturing, space research, that was just completely crazy. I mean, don't these, don't these guys just, you know, eat pies, drink iron brew, go to the football and climb mountains at the weekend, they're still feeling fit enough. So it's the so sometimes the new things that are happening can be an element of surprise, which is actually the old brand brings you so far, and you, then you look at this and say, "What?" and you actually become interested because it's so counterintuitive. And I think I mean the old brand is is also all about what tourists can do when they come to Scotland, really, isn't it? I mean, drink whiskey, climb mountains. You could have added golf in there, probably. Um, I, I, absolutely, golf links <laughs> golf in particular. And watch the J.K. Rowling train to Hogwarts go over the Glenfinnan Viaduct, which is bringing which is bringing half a million people a year, and is causing significant impact on the infrastructure around Glenfinnan, which is a very very small place. I didn't even know you could do that. My, I, I've definitely got one child who would be interested in that as a holiday destination. <laughs> okay, well, see you there. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, wonderful. Well, I think now we should um, go to your year, which is very, very late for me. Normally, I don't go beyond 1650. So um, which year are we going to travel back to today? We're traveling to 1967. Wow. Can you give us uh, a brief sort of picture of what's what's happening in 1967? Set the scene before we go to your moments. Well, 1967, in many ways, it's, it's a critical year, arguably the start of a critical period of um, recognition of the limitations of the UK's role in the world and therefore of its, global, of its global engagement. And it's also the year of, not, not the year of the last decolonization, but between 1961 and 67, there's a process whereby about 25 countries become independent. So I think people often date the end of the British Empire to withdraw from India. But an awful lot of politicians, um, Labour and Conservative, thought really the British Empire would continue for for decades, if not generations, to come after India because they thought that the African countries simply wouldn't be interested and and developed enough, that was their view, to actually become independent. But, of course, that um, that was the reason for Macmillan's Winds of Change speech in 1960 and these countries started to become independent very rapidly after that. And, you know, the, the country which wanted to hold on to, as it were, a, a colonial mentality within Africa itself, South Africa, was expelled from the Commonwealth in 1961. So when you get to 67, uh, there's a period which is historic because in June, the Mediterranean fleet is decommissioned. Uh, Sir John Hamilton is the last admiral. And that that fleet was first established by the, for the English Navy in 1654. So it's the last time, it's the last time and it's, it's only a squadron, but a, a, a really small boats by the time uh, it's dissolved. 
So it's a historic moment. It's a retreat from military commitments, policing Europe, and it's also, it also of course, associated with the independence of Malta. So um, it's, it's a critical moment. 1967 also sees not the insurgency in Aden, which leads to the British government, the British government, the British forces withdrawing from Aden. There's also, particularly, the Battle of Crater in the early part of the year, one of the last big global military Scots engagements when Mad Mitch's Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders um, uh, take back part of Aden from the National Liberation Front guerrillas. But Aden is abandoned on St Andrew's Day, 30th November 1967. And there is no proper government put in place and the National Liberation Front gain control of it and it becomes uh, the Republic of South Yemen and effectively a, 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 socialist, a socialist state. It's gone from a British port to a socialist state more or less overnight. It's an immense change. And, that, and then as part of this discussion, Mediterranean fleet aid and all in a few months, we get the final at the end of the year, the beginning of January 1968, we get the final statement of the withdrawal of um, British commitment west of Suez and a commitment to leave uh, not Hong Kong, where they stay until 19, uh, 1997, but British service bases in Malaysia and Singapore and elsewhere in, in East Asia. So the withdrawal, a withdrawal west of Suez, which is also a withdrawal from the Mediterranean, all happening in six months after 25 colonies have become independent in seven years, it's very quick, and 1967 is the beginning of, um, a, 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 I won't say the end, it's the beginning of a new beginning, but it's the beginning of a very different kind of United Kingdom and a good year to take for the end of the British Empire. But the three events I'm going to choose, are none of those are those that I've mentioned already. Good. Um and I wonder, I mean, this must have felt like quite a moment for people living in England. And I wonder, do you think it was similar for the Scots? Do you think they felt the same? Because, you know, they had been, as you discuss uh, in your book, they had been extremely involved in many aspects of the empire and had a huge stake in it. Do you think that for the sort of Scottish nation, uh, at large, it, this was a similar feeling of loss and sort of ending or not? Well, it, it, it was in a way, but in a different way. One of the interesting things that happens is not in the 60s and 70s, where there is a kind of revulsion from empire and also a real decline um, in, in interest in other parts of English history, which has been completely reversed in the last 20 years. But there's a hangover uh, in most of the UK Scotland, there's a sense that there is a sense of, of loss, but it's not a sense of uh, an empire lost. It's a sense of opportunities lost because uh, if you, uh, uh, the peak figure looking at um, uh, former pupils of the main borough grammar schools, state schools, uh, selective schools in Scotland that I came up with in research for this is that 40% of the obituaries in one school between 2000 and 2005 were of people, the last generation, who had spent at least some of their career in the British Empire. Mm. Now, uh, uh, the other figures are not as high as 40, but they're very significant nonetheless. That's a huge cadre of middle-class, educated Scots who suddenly have a very different career path laid in front of them. And so it had a disproportionate impact on their opportunities compared to the situation more broadly in the UK. Yeah. I think let's go to your first scene um, and we're going to Hamilton, which is in Ayrshire, isn't it? South of Glasgow. Lanarkshire, of course. Sorry, Lanarkshire. South of Glasgow. So um, tell us uh, what date is it and what, what's happening? So it's the 2nd of November 1967. The Scottish National Party candidate, Winnie Ewing, has been uh, selected in the words of her selection committee and in senior figures in the Scottish National Party to fly the flag and come a good second in a Labour stronghold, Hamilton. Uh, she runs an extremely uh, high-profile and showcase campaign, including an uh, hour-long car cavalcade in the weekend before the election. And on the night of 2nd November 1967, she wins by 2,000 votes over Labour. Uh, Labour are still 10 to 1 on at the bookies on the, on the day of the vote. 
Somebody would have made some money. Out of it, that. Somebody certainly must have made some money. But it, <laughs> the, the thing was, it came out of the blue. So a lot of by-election surprises are surprises, but they're not surprises by the last week. This was a surprise on the night, huge surprise on the night. Um, and in her victory speech, uh, she echoed one of her campaign posters, which shows her sitting on top of a globe. And she said, uh, stop the world, Scotland wants to get on. And this first uh, SNP victory at a, in a peacetime by-election, which is properly contested, marked a really significant change in Scottish and indeed UK politics, a, a transformation that is still going on. But it also marked a determination uh, to articulate Scotland's international persona at a time when the whole of the traditional international persona of the British Empire was collapsing. And Scotland was being affected by that collapse and being a much smaller country than England was, very, was, was much more aware of the huge loss of opportunity that it entailed. And she was a woman. That seems to me to be quite a, an unusual thing at that time. Is that right? She, it was. Winnie, um, Winnie, who's still alive, fairly young, she was 38 when she won, feisty, blonde Glasgow solicitor, very articulate, very determined, very, very pushy. One of those, I would say, but she was a natural feminist in the sense that she just expected... Yeah. to get her own way <laughs> and she usually she usually she usually did <laughs> and to to have a full political and indeed parliamentary career and to go on of course to serve for 20 years in the european parliament that was her version of getting on if you like so um it, she would you know she's a tremendously interesting political figure in her own right but it's a very significant moment and interestingly shortly after she wins and goes down to westminster Eamon de Valera, the aged Eamon de Valera, as president of the Irish Republic, invites her over on a visit to find out all about her and about the Scottish National Party that's won this by-election, uh, which is in uh, Winnie's autobiography. So she's very much, um, it's a critical moment. It's a moment which actually creates the British politics we have now, and certainly the Scottish politics we have now. And it happens right in the heart of a changing role for the UK and the world, which is defined by these and my other two dates. And how long had the um, SNP existed by that point? Was it very new? So the National Party of Scotland in 1920, uh, uh, 1928 and the Scottish Party of 1932 amalgamated in 1934 to form the Scottish National Party. Uh, they did win one wartime by-election in 1945, which was held for a few weeks. But in the 1966 general election, uh, they had 5% of the vote in Scotland and uh, they didn't even contest Hamilton. So um, it was a major change and a change which with various ups and downs and alterations of circumstance was a permanent one in the sense that they remained a major political force for the, having been a completely marginal minority party. Yeah, you would imagine Nicola Sturgeon might have a, a, a portrait of of her up on her wall, maybe? I don't know. She should. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> she did. I'm not sure if she's in the first minister's office or not, but, but Winnie had this wonderful gift for soundbites. So she was elected as many years later as one of the first MSPs in the, in the Holyrood uh, election in 1999. And she said, uh, she said the Scottish Parliament... It, um, adjourned in 1707 is hereby reconvened. So she had, she had really got an eye and an ear for these moments and making the most of them. Yeah, she sounds yeah she sounds wonderful. So let's um, let's move on to your second scene, um, which is a, a less less cheery one. I think we're going down to London. We are indeed. So it, this is 16 days after the Hamilton by election. 18th November 1967, but conversations will be had a, have been had about this for some years because there's an ongoing balance of payments deficit. And certainly the Hamilton by-election took place in the context of understanding that there might be what occurred on the 18th of November, which was a formal devaluation of the currency by 14%. So the pound was formally devalued by from $2.80 
to $2.40, which is more than twice what it is now. But it sounds terrifying. What were the ramifications of that for the, you know, for the economy? Well, it didn't. It was meant to boost the economy because it was meant to make exports cheaper. And like many things that have happened in the UK, and which have been export-led plans in the last 50, 70 years, it, has, it didn't work. So the economy didn't particularly grow. Inflation naturally rose because it's an overnight devaluation, very chunky one. And um, Harold Wilson, of course, famously as, as prime minister, came on television to say, this will not affect the pound in your pocket, um, which, of course, it did. <laughs> but uh, it was regarded as, as a critical moment. The Labour government had been resisting it since 1964. They were in a balance of payments, uh, a, a balance of payments crisis. 11 days after they devalued, the IMF offered a loan of 1.4 billion to the UK government um, because its the public finances were, were so poor. Cabinet preferred to go down a uh, deflation austerity road, which they had already started in July 1966. It's sounding awful familiar, isn't it? it I mean, I was going to say, this literally, <laughs> it's like Groundhog Day, isn't it? It's extraordinary. Jim Callaghan, who was the Chancellor, resigned on the 21st of November and was moved to the Home Office in the sense that he'd done the honourable thing, but it wasn't really his fault. If you know, in other words, it was a, it was a prime ministerial decision. Um, I know doing the honourable thing is not, however, a Groundhog Day thing. That's just an old thing. Yeah. So this was a moment, and it's just before, of course, the introduction of the first um, decimal coins in 1968. This is a moment when the currency sterling appears to be, for the first time, not sterling anymore. Mm. It's, it's, it's the beginning of a long and often much slower and less dramatic devaluation, but a devaluation which continues to affect the pound to this day. And which, I guess, I view as a historian, there's very little proper public discussion of. Um, one talks about the exchange rate on the markets from day to day, but the sense that it's generally speaking going down and down and down and down and down has been for a long time. Um, that uh, against, I mean, major currencies is now less than one and a half Swiss francs, for example. Then that's that's much less discussed. But the moment when that becomes an unavoidable feature of the British economy is when Wilson is forced to devalue. Yeah, I mean, I think I've heard a few times recently with regards to the IMF and that, that there has been sort of reference made to other points in our history when our economy has been you know, unstable for whatever reason. But I think you're right. I think it would be really helpful to have a longer view on these things. And I think the way the media reports them, you get whipped up into this sort of frenzy of, you know, things going wrong, things going wrong, things are so bad. And actually, if you look back in history, you can see that, you know, things have also been bad before and, and they've come up again and, you know, perhaps you can have a bit of hope. I, I don't know. Perhaps that's a naive... Uh, so I think I think it's... I think you need to be... I, I think you need to have people to be hopeful about. So let's hope we've got people to be hopeful about. Yeah, let's... Um, on that note, uh, let's move on to our third scene, which is... I mean, not 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 much more cheerful. I mean, the echoes with today are just in this particular year and these these scenes that you have chosen are, are really quite striking. So tell us, um, where, where are we going for our third scene? I think Paris. Can we go to Paris to cheer ourselves up a little bit? <laughs> We're going to Charles de Gaulle's second veto as president of France and the Fifth Republic, his second veto of UK membership of the... European Economic Community. His first veto was in 1963. Uh, his second in 1967 was couched in very much the same terms. The interesting thing, of course, was that um, Macmillan's government had come to the conclusion that the UK's economy could not flourish outside the European community. Uh, Wilson's government came to the same conclusion. They both were kept out. Heath's government came to the same conclusion, uh, or indeed had the same conclusion to begin with, but de Gaulle was dead, and so the UK was admitted to the EEC in 1973. But de Gaulle's veto to an audience of about a 1,000 civil servants and uh, French public officials and academics noted, he was very clear, he noted uh, uh, that the UK 
did not share the continental idea of integration. Sometimes people who support Brexit have said, oh, well, it was just a market in the 1970s. Nobody ever wanted political integration. It's not true. It's always been there. And, and de Gaulle made that clear in 1967. He also said that the, within the United Kingdom, there was, he said England, uh, there's a deep-seated hostility to Europe uh, and that there was a fundamental lack of interest in the European idea and that radical change would be needed in the social outlook, social and political outlook of the United Kingdom economy and political classes for the UK to be a good member of the European community. It's so prescient, isn't it? I mean, it, it's... Yeah, this, uh, de Gaulle is, uh, whatever one thinks of him, is, is a tremendous statesman in terms of his ability to have huge foresight. And of course, because of his, his exile uh, in the UK in World War II, he, he actually knew the society pretty well. Interestingly enough, and one of the reasons he put him to be in the book is that he was, his uncle was a famous pan-Celticist scholar in France. So de Gaulle knew a great deal about Scotland and set up a, a, specific, hou a specific house, which is now the home of the Consul General, in Edinburgh in 1942. So, um, indeed, de Gaulle uh, uh, allegedly refused to, be, to uh, disembark on the plane that landed on French soil in 1944 until they could find a French uh, Scottish staff officer to do it. And a major Macintosh was eventually located and sent and took de Gaulle off the plane. So there's a lot to de Gaulle, but fundamentally he understood something. And he, he, even in his last year of his life, he was interviewed privately and he said, the United Kingdom has to decide whether it will be uh, Atlantic or European. And its tragedy is it will be unable to decide the answer to that question. Well, and to go back to your point earlier about 25% recognising the stars and stripes, do you think that he considered that Scotland, so if, you know, let's imagine Scotland had been independent then and they had been asking to be members of the what was it? it was the EEA was it called the European Economic EEC Economic Community then do you think that would have been a different kettle of fish um I think it probably would but uh, but uh, that's only because I think uh, of course de Gaulle was much too good a, a politician ever to say anything that might suggest uh except in Quebec where his vive Quebec libre speech um, had uh, had a big impact. He was prepared to go over, the, you know, over the top to disturb Canadian French relations there, but he wouldn't have said anything about independent Scotland. But he was aware that Scotland was different, and he was, mm. uh, uh, and that was very clear in the way that he conducted himself. And uh, in the 1940s, indeed, the fact that a lot of the location for the training of the Free French was in Scotland. One of the interesting things about World War Two is that is that the, a lot of the, the Polish and French soldiers. Uh, involved in the war actually are based in Scotland, a very, a very high and disproportionate number of them. And why was that? It's an interesting question. There was space for them, uh, but there was also regarded as being a welcome for them. And uh, it was also because it was uh, the headquarters of commando training and commando training at Achnacare was regarded as, uh, as important for free French and other forces because of the element in which those forces might conceivably be deployed uh, to uh, destabilise German rule while it was still relatively intact through commando raids and so forth. And so to ask a question about the contemporary situation, how much of a role do you think Brexit will play in the next Scottish referendum? So how, how important do you think that is for Scottish people? It is definitely important. Ooh. I think uh, there are divisions in Scotland as elsewhere. So Brexit has had a definite positive support on independence, but it's not an unconditional support because a significant number of uh, supporters of independence did vote to leave in 2016, a minority, but not an insignificant minority. And um, one of the interesting things there is that they tend to be very different from Bre standard Brexiteers, but they tend to, to favour an EEA or EFTA trade-based model rather. I mean, they don't, they don't want the sort of shining jewel in a silver sea sending its destroyers all over the planet uh, to police it um, or whatever happens to be in the global British mindset. But they want to have, a tra the, 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 the refuseniks in Scotland tend to want to have a, an EEA-style, a Norwegian-style 
relationship rather than integrationist relationship. So there is that element. But on the whole, um, Brexit has impacted positively on in terms of the numbers of those who support independence. The question is how how much how critical it's going to get and how fast and whether it's going to be critical elsewhere in the UK as well because Brexit ha- we talked about economic troubles in 1967 but um Brexit has simply objectively a major and ongoing economic impact and I think that's increasingly recognized uh, throughout the UK but not yet at all in the political debate which is an extraordinary and very interesting gap um and is a, a lot of it is i think concerned with the um labor party's simultaneous commitment to winning back places like Hartlepool and Burnley but also not because they don't have any activists on the ground in those places at one point there were as many labor members in brighton almost as there were in the whole of scotland um they don't have people on the ground then and so they don't actually know what the red wall voter wants because they don't actually have enough people to talk to them. So they imagine that they want definite, they're, they're, they're 100% Brexiteers, and of course some of them are. Mm-hmm. But it's, uh, I think the way in which Labour are not nuancing that question is arguably to do both with the importance of these seats to them and also their lack of knowledge of, the, of what people actually doing or wanting on a day-to-day basis in those seats. Well, and it is extremely difficult, isn't it, for them to, uh, to appeal to all those i mean there are especially especially when you take scotland then there's a lot of different constituents not constituencies i don't mean that in terms of you know geographical areas but but political views and it is extremely complicated i mean and the, and it's the same for the conservatives isn't it they're trying to appeal to um all these different communities of people in the country and it actually in in some ways you could think well perhaps we just need different we need new political parties Perhaps we need a rearrangement or just maybe a bit more choice. Or, I, I, don't, I don't know. Well, I think the, the difficulty is that the first past the post system creates uh, all sorts of unstable promises and mm, compromises yeah. and governments, frankly. You can see even government with a large majority isn't particularly stable if it's got factions within itself that think that their particular view is more important than anybody else's. So It works in Denmark, though. Uh, <laughs> You believe her in first past the post? Well, I don't know. I just think the, the the sort of binary choice. I think is is it's not good, and I think it disenfranchises a lot of people because they feel that neither party represents them, and therefore, but there's no point in vo- voting for anyone else. Therefore, they don't vote, and that's a huge problem. And living in a democracy and not voting, I think, is you know that's just unforgivable. It's Especially as a woman, you know, we weren't allowed to vote for all those centuries. No, well, I, I, I don't know. absolutely. And I think it's true for young people as well. I think one of the, I mean, arguably the policies of the major parties, particularly the Conservatives, discriminate against the young and in favour of the old. But partly that's the result of young people not voting for so many years, not turning out. Uh, and, you know, if everyone who turns out is is um, you know, more likely to, to be uh, anti-immigrant, anti-Europe, nostalgic, conservative. There's such a huge disparity now between the proportion of people who vote conservative over 65 and those who vote conservative under 35. It's never been as large as it is now. So there are other divisions that are coming in on the back of a, of a, of a very bifurcated choice. Um, and they're not helpful either. No. And to go back to your talking about the, you know, the UK in 1967, so one of the, one of the reasons that, that they weren't allowed to join was financial. I mean, they just devalued their currency. And and I think that's something which I've definitely heard said about even if we were talking about Brexit and we were talking about trying to strengthen the relationship in some way or, or join some kind of economic or uh, trade um, arrangement, you know, at the moment, but would we, we're not, we wouldn't be negotiating from a position of strength at the moment. So would that be a good thing? Would they let us in? <laughs> Oh, if if the UK, I mean the, the the EU, the UK would never get back what it had, which was no, thanks no. To, thanks to Mrs Thatcher a very good deal, but allegedly not a good deal at all. But actually, compared to other countries of similar economic heft, a very good deal. So, but it'd be easier to get back into the European Economic Area, and that would mitigate probably two thirds of the economic damage, uh, if not three quarters. So, I think that's a that's a reasonable goal, but as for as for um, negotiating from a position of strength, I think that that, that 
it really depends whether um, the Daily Express and the Daily Mail are right about the UK's ability to negotiate from a position of strength or not. Mm, absolutely. This has been so fascinating, but I have to ask you the final question, um, which is if you could have taken something from one of these moments in 1967 and brought it back with you to keep for your very own, what would it be? It would be a $1 silver certificate note because uh, the United States kept a variant of the gold standard uh, under the Bretton Woods Agreement until 1971. Gold was, uh, had a fixed exchange rate at $35, $35 an ounce. Silver remained monetized as part of the US currency until 1968. So if you had a $1 silver certificate note, you could exchange it for $1 worth of silver. That was suspended in 1968. So 1967 is the last year of having issued silver, as far as I know, it may be that some were issued in 1968, of silver $1 certificates. So it's, it's a situation where this is the end of so much. It's the end of the gold standard. It's the end of the British Empire. It's the end of the, of the unqualified belief that sterling is a strong currency. And it's the beginning of complete change in Scotland's role in UK politics. So we're, we, we need to recognise in bringing that back, that we're bringing back something which seems incredibly ancient. And yet it's still in the lifetime of a lot of people who are alive today, including myself. Wow, that's a very good choice. Um, and this has been... Such an interesting conversation. Thank you so much for coming on Travels Through Time. It's been lovely to meet you. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Violet. You're so professional and so engaged.